Good afternoon and welcome to the latest in the Churches Conservation Trust's series of our Thursday lunchtime lectures. We're really excited that today we're joined by the Reverend Canon Anthony Howe, who is chaplain at Hampton Court Palace, which is one of the historic royal palaces. Um, Father Anthony is a chaplain to Her Majesty the Queen and as such is a member of the Royal Household. So thank you, Father, for joining us today. Okay. Before um, I pass you on to our Chief Executive, Peter Reyes, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the work we do and how we've been dealing with lockdown during the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, I'm just going to set some guidelines for how these lectures work, um, if you've never joined us before or if you um, just want a refresher. So um, the only way you can watch this is through Facebook Live. Um, we don't stream it onto any other pages. So if anyone sends any links um, saying you can, don't click it. Um, you can watch it on our page. Um, the easiest way um, going forward for you to um, get a notification about when we go live is if you like Church's Conservation Trust as a page um, on your own um, Facebook account, you'll be notified by Facebook um, when we go live and you just click that and it takes you straight into this live stream so it's really easy for you to take part and enjoy these lectures. These lectures are completely free and we encourage you to submit questions. So um, during the Father Anthony's talk, please do, if you have any questions, type them in that chat box there um, and you'll be able, we'll put those questions to Father Anthony at the end of his talk. Now, as I said, these lectures are completely free of charge. We don't charge you to um, charge any fee to, for you to enjoy or watch these films. We do ask though, if you do enjoy them, that you consider making a donation. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can firstly text CCT to 70331, and that will give us a text um, or give us a gift of three pounds, and we can claim gift aid on that. Alternatively, you can make a donation securely through our website, which is visitchurches.org.uk. And finally, um, we've launched a special offer um, in response to people who have been watching our lectures and contacting us about membership schemes. We do run a membership scheme here at the Church Conservation Trust. And what we're doing is if you sign up to become a member um, and if you tick the direct debit box and if you give a monthly or an annual gift, um, monthly it's as little as £3.50. Um, in return, we're um, sending all new members a free copy of Beautiful Churches by Matthew Byrne, which normally retails for about £20. So um, if you sign up um, today or over the, over the summer, um, you'll get a free copy of that. Now there's details of how to um, get that, that copy of your book in the description of this video. But as I said, thank you so much for joining. Um, if you've got questions, please do um, use that box there. But I'm going to hand you over now to Peter Ayres, um, who's going to tell you a bit about our work. Thank you, George. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Thursday lunchtime uh, lecture. I feel um, uh, contrasted deeply from our um, from our very sober-looking uh, Reverend Canon Anthony Howe. I'm in a Hawaiian shirt, and he's in his uh, his clerical splendour. Um, so uh, apologies for that. Uh, I, so we're the Church's Conservation Trust. Now, we've been around for about 50 years, um, just over 50 years. And our job is to look after historic places, which are historic churches, which are no longer have a working congregation and that uh, they're too special to do anything like convert them into housing or demolish them. And so we hold this collection on behalf of the nation. And over the 50 years or so we've been in existence, we've gathered a collection of 356 of these churches right across England. Now, we take on about two or three more churches every year uh, and we do that against a declining background of, of income that we get from statutory sources of the, the church and the government. And so we raise a huge amount of money ourselves. Now, over this lockdown period, this has been timed exactly to the time when we would do all of our fundraising events and when we would have all of our um, uh, income coming in from all the things we do in our churches and also Champing. And if you haven't heard of Champing, go to champing.org.uk because it is the best social isolation uh, 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 holiday you can take. You want a staycation? Champing's the thing to do. So over this period of time, our income has been significantly hit to the tune of about half a million pounds, and that money would normally be spent on repairing these fantastic churches. So please do consider donating to help us fill that gap in our income. <clears throat> 
obviously we're not downtrodden and we're not downhearted because we're here to support the communities around those beautiful buildings get them open again and i'm pleased to say that from the 6th of july we will be beginning to open our churches once more so please keep checking on our website uh, to see the details of those churches that are opening they won't all open at once but we will be opening from the 6th of july and gradually we'll get that collection open again for you to go and experience and and witness but please uh, do remember that you can stay in touch with us by signing up to our free newsletter you can be even nicer and join our membership programs uh, there are several different forms of membership you can take depending on how much money you think it's worth um, and there are different benefits to each of those and as George said you get a free book as well which can't be a bad thing about beautiful churches so without any further ado I shall pass you over to the Reverend Canon Anthony Howe now is uh, a man who was educated in the same school as Thomas Wolsey. So there's quite a direct connection uh, between him and high offices of state. Um, born in Suffolk and educated in Ipswich, where we have a fantastic church called um, St. Mary at Quay. Um, uh, graduated at uh, Queen's College in Oxford um, be before becoming a chaplain in September uh, 2015. Um, Having served uh, several, a couple of curacies and uh, been a vicar in West Yorkshire, uh, he's now become chaplain of Hampton Court Palace uh, Chapel Royal, as you, will, as you will have heard earlier. So he's responsible for serving uh, Her Majesty the Queen, uh, as well as undertaking services for residents and staff in the palace. And he also uh, provides a ministry to visitors and regular worshippers. Now, um, he did say, I, I did ask him how lockdown had been for him, and he did reveal that it's been awfully tough being on his own in a palace uh, over the <laughs> lockdown period. So I'm sure he'll communicate more about that as we go through. But there's also a, a thing I wanted to do. The, he, the man is also a, a top level book sleuth, uh, and he did in, it in fact uncover or discover an incredibly rare Tudor book on eBay a few years ago, um, or quite recently. I, can't, I didn't got a date for when you found it, but an amazing story of how he found a 1594 book of common prayer that had been used uh, by Queen Elizabeth the first courtiers so uh, uh, there's no end to this man's talents so <laughs> without further ado let me hand you over to um, Father Anthony Howe. Thank you very much and and uh, you may disagree with that after you've heard this lecture and I have to say I think I, I wish I had gone for the um, Hawaiian shirt as well because the plastic collar is not the most comfortable thing to wear. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be doing this and um, this is basically an introduction uh, to this strange thing that is the Chapel Royal, and certainly this Chapel Royal in the time of the Tudor period. In 1645, following the King's crushing defeat at the Battle of Naseby, the agents of Sir Robert Harley's somewhat Soviet sounding committee for the demolition of monuments of superstition and idolatry entered the Chapel Royal of Hampton Court Palace in order to purge the temple of all such filthy matter that was disagreeable to the word of God. There was nothing unusual there, of course. London being at the very epicentre of religious, political and cultural life was always going to suffer the worst from the whims and wills of whichever religious polity happened to be in vogue at the time. Nothing changes. But unlike Paris, there is almost no indigenous medieval stained glass left in the churches here. The purge of Hampton Court Chapel accompanied that of those in the other royal palaces. We know that Harley's men were thorough to the point of pain. Unlike the rest of Charles I's incredible art collection that was found, that that was found in his chapels had been polluted in their minds by the taints of veneration. And so these images, far from being simply redundant but valuable assets like the rest of it, had crossed the bar as to be the epitome of blasphemy. And so nothing short of destruction would do. There was something almost ritualistic about it, recalling the almost gleeful orgy of iconoclasm that had especially accompanied the Edwardine purging of churches and little more than a century before. Recall the fate of the great monstrance at Durham Cathedral that met its end literally by being jumped up and down on. And of course, we've been watching the news and the images are spookily prescient as what's going on around the world today with various statues. But I'm gonna leave that subject well alone. 
And so anything attached to the Chapel Royal, at least the Chapel Royal in London, had to go lock, stock and barrel. This was not least due to the fact that the Chapel Royal itself was totemic. Then, just as now, the chapel epitomised the spiritual life of the sovereign, who, in turn, as the supreme governor of the Church of England, represented that body publicly to those at home and abroad. And so the chapel was a showpiece to curious foreign ambassadors, both of the regal majesty and religion, making the point that this newfangled English religion aped neither Rome nor Geneva that found its source in something far more ancient, far more Catholic than all the shouting voices in Europe may have conceded. Increasingly, as the fledgling Reformed Church of England matured, successive monarchs found in its polity a spiritual endorsement for their own, to the extent that Presbyter a Presbyterian educated King of Scotland could ultimately, and rather fatally, as it turned out, claim no bishops, no king. And so Harley's destruction of that glass mattered, just as the removal of every superstitious image in East Anglia mattered to the fanatical Will Dowsing. These were not simply things that could be ignored. They represented repression, false religion, and worst of all possible things, perdition to anyone who may have had the unfortunate experience of coming into contact with them. It was the logical final piece in their jigsaw which had been rudely interrupted by the accession, firstly, of Queen Mary, who had put the whole process of reformation into reverse, and then by another queen who had no intention of letting the ultra-godly clergy having their own way. Now, that was very much the traditional view taken of these momentous years by amateur of churches and church crawlers and historians. But as we all know, history is not simply to misquote the history boys here, just one thing after another. Yes, there are of course facts, but as we who engage in history, we find it's far more akin to a forensic investigation, which often leaves us asking more questions than we were trying to answer. And those are the Hampton Court windows present a perfect example. Now ordinarily, destruction would be the end of the story. Once a work of art is gone, unless there is some sort of record, it is gone. Stained glass by its very nature was prey to being, being forgotten by the iconoclast and traditionalist alike, since it never really performed any function apart from actually looking rather nice. However, this particular scheme here stands out because we know exactly what it was. For there is, <coughs> excuse me, for one, there is a, a contemporary report of a surgery, which goes like this. Sir Robert Harley gave order for the putting down and demolishing of the popish and superstitious pictures at Hampton Court, where this day the altar was taken down and the table brought into the body of the church. The rails pulled down and the steps levelled and the popish pictures and superstitious images that were in the glass windows were also demolished and order given for new glazing them with plain glass. And among the rest, there was pulled down the picture of Christ nailed to the cross which was placed right above the altar, and also the pictures of Mary Magdalene and others weeping by the foot of the cross, and such other idolatrous pictures were pulled down and demolished. Well, there's no doubting the writer's intent there. And so this describes the wrecking of what one might call a Laudian interior. And from those surviving Oxford and Cambridge colleges, it is not too difficult to imagine what it may have looked like. We know that from the time of Elizabeth, there had been an image of the crucified Lord behind or indeed on the altar. And indeed in her case, it was a crucifix that was broken by the court jester. We know that the paintings were commissioned from favorite artists to be altar pieces, accompanied by fine woodwork, all of which provided a stage setting for the exquisite Chapel Royal plate, which of course we have, but from after the restoration. But although at Hampton Court, none of that particular stuff survives, not least there, we are rather unfortunate, fortunate of having a unique glimpse further. In 1983, a remarkable discovery was made in the print room of the Musée Royal de Beaux in Brussels, forgive my French pronunciation. These were a series of 24 designs by Erhard Schon for a set of windows, which are called Videmuses, for which turned out to be here the chapel at Hampton Court. 
that story is worth a talk on its own and so I'm conscious that I'm not here just to talk about chapel glass I will pass over that for somebody more uh, qualified but the important thing for us today is that we know exactly what have, would have been in those windows that were destroyed in 1645 and so accordingly the central light of the east window right above the high altar depicted the crucifixion with Mary Magdalene embracing the base of the cross just as Harley's men described. The side windows were two-tiered and on the lower le level there were apostles on the north side and doctors of the church with the prophets on the south, whilst on the upper level of the window showed scenes from the life of Christ and importantly his mother, starting with the Annunciation right through to the end the coronation of the Virgin. Now the more Catholic Amunded amongst you will immediately recognize that as the mysteries of the rosary. So let us take a moment to consider this. Whilst Henry's glaziers were kept busy as wives kept coming and going, for instance, St. Catherine in the East Window was the first casualty to be, re to be replaced by St. Anne, the survival of this mount of imagery, if it indeed did, in this place is frankly remarkable. As Dermot McCulloch documents in his study of Edwardine religion, Tudor Church Militant, such striking reminders of idolatry would have directly countered the reforming mindset, not least, of course, of the young King Edward VI. It is a fallacy to imagine, as some high church types like me have in the past, that he was a young, impressionable boy manipulated by the wicked geniuses of Somerset, Northumberland, and the more extreme bishops like Hooper. We will have none of that nonsense. Edward, who had been provided with the very best of a reformed education a prince could have, was rather instrumental in it all, even himself suggesting at one point the removal of the cross of St George from the insignia of the Order of the Garter. Again, it's remarkable, given some of the things we see this week, that we don't actually have to look very far for modern day comparisons if we want to understand it. And so after the relatively conservative Reformation of Henry, Many, and Cranmer himself included, were chomping at the bit to get down to the real thing. The Archbishop had by that stage abandoned any vestiges of belief, even in, the Lutheran, in a Lutheran Eucharistic presence. And the pace with which the reforms now came with the accession of the young king indicate to many how long that had been in planning. Beginning with the 1547 Book of Homilies and Injunctions, and then followed a year later by an English order of giving communion, and then, of course, in 1549, worship changed beyond all recognition with the first Book of Common Prayer, then to reach its apogee with the second in 1552. In fact, actually, whilst we now think of that second prayer book as the high point of the Edwardine ideal of the Reformation, it very would probably, probably, very probably would have itself been supplanted by an even more reformed version wherein almost all vestiges of medieval precedence would have been laid aside, somewhat like the Puritan order that was put out in 1645. Had Lady Jane Grey managed to retain the throne more than a few days, I very much doubt whether we would now have such scenes as Coral Evensong. Edward, who was compared by contemporary writers to the Israelite reformer King Josiah, purged the temple spiritually and physically. It was then very natural that a lead should be taken by his own chapel royal. And indeed, evidence exists in the Wanley Park books of early settings of the liturgy in English by the chapel royal composers, both newly written pieces and adaptations of those which, due to their musical style, would have been considered relatively acceptable for the new religion. Life for the chapel royal musicians such as Tallis and Shepherd must have been stressful, to say the least. Because, not just, because then, just as now, the gentlemen of the Chapel Royal would have gone around gigging elsewhere at city churches to make up their income. But as reform became increasingly inevitable, many of these establishments either pared back their musical provision uh, deeply or just stopped doing it. Music was very much a relic of the past. And what was then sung in Geneva bore very little resemblance to what had been sung even in its simpler form by the end of the reign of Henry VIII. The cathedral, as it was then, of Westminster, now Westminster Abbey, under the still rather conservative Bishop Thirlby, rather dragged its heels when it came to new things, 
and for a time even remarkably refused to introduce the 1549 prayer book. St Paul's was a little bit better, but the lead of course had to come from the centre. The Chapel Royal itself, where the boss was and still is, no less than the monarch. If the recalcitrant prelates such as Gardiner of Winchester were to be brought into line and abandon any notion of playing at mass, as he had suggested that could be done with the 1549 liturgy, the chapel was best placed to prove an example. Unfortunately for us, there are almost no records whatsoever of what went on in the reformed chapel of this new Josiah, apart from one or two tantalising hints. In 1551, for example, Edward received the Order of St Michael from the King of France. Now that would have been rather dodgy in several ways. And on Michaelmas, he invited the French ambassador to the Chapel Royal at Hampton Court to celebrate. Both the Orders of St Michael and the Order of the Garter were there displayed. And the ambassador wrote that he saw the King reverently with us of his council communicate the sacrament, wherein he says, we perceive he seeth and understandeth the great difference between our reverence in our religion and the slanders thereof usually placed, spread by evil men. So here is no anarchic free for all, but a sense of order and possibly even accompanied by some music somewhere. For, for whilst reduced, the Chapel Royal Choir nevertheless still survived, which in some senses is quite remarkable. But far more remarkable was that what have, would have been the stage set to this new reform celebration of the Lord's Supper. For whilst down below the table may have indeed been placed in the midst of the chapel, we don't know, but probably was, this was probably surrounded by all the images and mysteries of the rosary, and not least, of course, Henry's glorious roof that still exists. And so this paradox introduces us to one of the great mysteries and indeed characteristics of the Tudor and Stuart Chapel Royal, in that it was both an example of what should and what should not be done. As well as the Hampton Court windows, I point people to the Royal College of St George at Windsor, which in many ways best epitomises the ancient ceremonial life of the monarchy. I'm sure that most of you will be familiar with the chapel. But it is a bit of an anomaly. Stained glass aside, there is of course the west window that survives, more pre-reformation -pre imagery survives in that place, in place, than almost anywhere else in the country. For instance, the glorious 15th century garter stalls preserve to this day images that simply just wouldn't have made it, not least those on the stall of the monarch himself. Whilst the crucifixion and one or two others have been neatly removed, almost everything else survives. And this is no less than incredible when we consider Edward's musings about whether or not to expunge the cross of St George. Some may detect in all of this, and indeed the surviving obits that still take place at Windsor, a degree of regal cognitive dissonance or even doublethink. Given that much of the Windsor and Hampton Court chapels, amongst other things, were of course the work of Edward's father, he, true to Tudor values, place them in a category of their own. It is as if these images were not monuments primarily to superstition, but to the essential but fragile Tudor dynasty. Yes, while some of the fripperies may justly be removed, and the whole scale and visible deconstruction of the handiwork of his most rev revered father might have proved just a little bit too much for Edward, and possibly the country, a step too farther, far. The family line had to be maintained, although, as we all know, this became more and more of a problem as the prospect of succession reared its ugly head. Such desecration and the memory of one's parents might then risk breaking the commandments just as much as the worshipping of a false image. Josiah Edward might have been, but he was only that by the fact that he was in every way his father's son. So too, then Elizabeth was her father's daughter, and in many ways far more akin to Henry than Edward. On coming to the throne, she had of course no choice but to revert to the reformed faith, since the Bishop of Rome did not acknowledge her as a legitimate um, offspring in the first place. She was also left with little choice when virtually all of her inherited bishops refused to play ball, but to select successors largely from those who had fled to the foreign shores, to escape the religion of her sister. 
Parker, her newly chosen Archbishop of Cam Canterbury, who actually did sit it out, was the exception rather than the rule. And so in doing, and much to her own personal chagrin, Elizabeth was forced to import the Genevan influence back into the land and to the church. And in so doing, sowed the seeds that not only resulted in the destruction of the Hampton Court glass in 1645, but many more images like it. Elizabeth's personal, personal taste for religion is well known and well documented. Whilst it is posited that she may have preferred initially to revert to the liturgy of 1549, that was always going to be a bit of a non-starter in the country. It appeared still too much to be like the mass and her bishops from Geneva would have had none of that. Therefore, injunctions were quickly issued to ensure that this should not happen. But what, what might suit the country need not constrict the monarch. Like her father, Elizabeth loved music. She also disliked, in fact, detested preaching. And this in itself set her on a collision course, not least with Parker's successor, Grindle, who had the temerity to disobey the queen over this matter but the rather good luck to retain his life. There is also evidence that Elizabeth first personally intervened when the convocations of clergy edged towards further reform in matters such as the abolition of organs. They very nearly went. She placed her reformation firmly upon a stone, which was around about 1551, and her Tudor obstinacy dictated that it, and thus the Church of England of which she was supreme governor, would remain there. The chapel royal in her time therefore became a beacon of culture which impressed foreign ambassadors and scandalized native puritans in equal measure its musical life was justly famous aided by the queen continuing the practice of purloining the best singers from other institutions liturgically it very much mirrored dean gabriel goodman's newly established college at westminster abbey where importantly the rising stars of the later century such as lancelot andrews later began to make their mark. Andrews, who was a canon of Westminster, succeeded Goodman in 1601, and he was in turn succeeded in 1605 by Richard Neal, who ultimately became Bishop of Durham. And so the two royal peculiars, Chapel Royal, Westminster and D, that at Windsor, practiced a religion that would have been unimaginable almost anywhere else, save perhaps in a few private chapels of nobility but which through its main proponents gradually exerted an influence far beyond its natural realm. Here then, as Dermot McCulloch remarks in his chapter in the recently published History of Westminster Abbey, we see the seeds of what is commonly known as Laudianism. In fact, it is no far longer established royal religion. McCulloch calls it Westminster, but as we see, it encompassed all of the Queen's establishments. And it was through their close association and favour with the crown that its proponents both excelled at court and beyond. So what might one of these services have looked like? Well, we are incredibly unfortunate to have a detailed account of one of them, which is the Eucharist of Easter Day in 1593 at St James's Palace. It comes from what is known as the old checkbook of the Chapel Royal, which is basically the record of our chapel's activities, personnel and, uh, of course, the accounts of the institution. And so it gives a very good glimpse of what things were up to. And I'm going to read to you um, a detailed account of what was written by the then sub-dean and former friar, Anthony Anderson, and it merits reading in length. It's in Tudor English here, so do excuse if I stumble over part of it, but it's worth hearing. The most sacred Queen Elizabeth upon Easter day after the Holy Gospel was read in the chapel at St. James's came down into Her Majesty's Travis. Before Her Highness came the gentlemen pensioners, then the barons, the bishops, London and Land Landaff, the earls and the honourable council in their colours of state, the herald, heralds at arms, and the Lord Keeper bearing the great seal himself, and the Earl of Hereford bearing the sword before Her Majesty. Then Her Majesty's royal person came most cheerfully, having as noble supporters the Right Honourable, the Earl of Essex, master of Her Majesty's horse, and on the right hand, the Right Honourable Lord Admiral, on the left, the Lord Chamberlain to Her Majesty. Also next before Her Majesty, 
attendant all the while, entered her traverse most devoutly, there kneeling. After some prayer, she came princely before the table, and there humbly kneeling did offer the golden obeisance. The bishop, the honourable father of Worcester, holding the golden basin, the sub-dean, the epistler in rich copes, assistant to the said bishop, which done her majesty returned to her princely traverse, sumptuously set forth until the present action of the Holy Communion, continually exercised in earnest prayer. And then the blessed sacrament first received of the said bishop and administered to the sub-dean, the gospeler for that day, and to the epistler, her sacred person presented herself before the Lord's table, royally attended as before, where she was set a stately stool in cushions for her majesty, and so humbly kneeling with the most singular devotion and holy reverence, did most comfortably receive the most blessed sacrament of Christ's body and blood in the kinds of bread and wine, according to the laws established by her majesty and godly laws in parliament. The bread being wafer bread, of some thicker substance which Her Majesty in her most reverend manner took of the Lord Bishop in her naked right hand. Her satisfied her fixing her semblant eyes upon the, upon the worthy words of the sacramental pronounced by the Bishop, and that with such an holy aspect as it did mightily add comforts and to the godly beholders whereof this writer was very one well near. And likewise Her Majesty received the cup having a most princely lined cloth laid on her cushioned pillow and borne at four ends by the noble Earl of Hereford, the Earl of Essex, the Earl of Worcester, and the Earl of Oxford. The side of the said cloth Her Majesty took up in her hand and therewith took the foot of a golden and now sacred cup and with like holy reverend attention as before to the sacrament, sacramental words did drink of the same most devoutly, all this while kneeling on her knees to the confirmation of her faith and absolute comfort in her purged conscience by the Holy Spirit of God in the exercise of this Holy Communion, of her participation of and in the merits and death of Christ Jesus our Lord, and the perfect communion and spiritual food of the very body and blood of Christ our Saviour. And so returning to her said Travis, there devoutly stayed the end of prayers, which done her majesty royally ascended the way and stairs into her presence whom the Lord bless forever and ever. Amen. Well, there we have it. There's some rather high service there. Three sacred ministers in rich and doubtless medieval copes, a distinct offertory that's basically called so. Accompanied by the organ music of Dr. Bull, the organist, we know that he played the use of wafer bread. So not ordinary bread, but wafer bread, which goes back to the 1549 prayer book all in the context of this richly adorned chapel at St James's Palace, and the same would have been here, that had on the altar, altar candlesticks and the image of a crucified Lord. None of this remotely bears any resemblance to the ideals of Edward VI church militant, nor indeed to the sparse rubrics of his 1552 Book of Common Prayer that Elizabeth reissued, give or take one or two important modifications. Indeed, as well as the 1549 BCP, we are far more reminded of a ritual accompanying the coronation. And of course, that is no accident whatsoever. Those officiating and occasionally preaching at the court must have been taken aback by all of this at first, as they were bishops and they would have behaved very differently in their diocese. But with the Queen's longevity, it would have gradually become accepted as the norm of the place. Bishops will do what bishops have to do in order to play the court game, be it a weekend at Balmoral with Elizabeth II or a high mass with Elizabeth I, as it were. It should become so established in that way that when the Calvinist-minded James VI and I assumed the English throne, nothing changed in the chapel. Copes were worn for almost everything not least by the gentlemen of the choir. I mean, if they had an ambassador who came to sign a treaty, the, the, the dean would be there in a cope just to celebrate it. They put on their tact for whatever they did. The music continued. It was as sumptuous, if not more so than ever. Andrews, who by his preaching had become a favorite of the new dean, the new king and the dean of the chapel royal, and then Bishop Neil, 
who through his Durham house meetings was able to promote the brilliant young things like John Cozin and Matthew Wren, all came to dominate court religion. Long before the aesthetically beautiful but fatal partnership of Charles I and William Lord, it was with their ever increasing confidence and the understandable but ultimately mistaken assumption that the court bubble could exercise a greater influence than it really did in ecclesiastical matters, that this high church revival took place. Whilst its apogee was during the reign of Charles I, its seeds were very much sown very long before by the private and not so private practices of its proponents, not least of course the monarchs. The ill-fated Scotch prayer book of 1637, whilst notorious, was like that other short-lived offering, the prayer book of 1552, one that actually eventually punched far above its weight by its influence on later liturgical Anglican revision. Whilst often and popularly described, ascribed again, not least in name, to the likes of Lord, it was in fact nominally a Scottish creation, largely the work of James, Vedder, James Vederburn, Bishop of Dunblane and then Dean of the Scottish Chapel Royal. It looks back to and restores, as many of you will know, much of the 1549 liturgy. But whereas that was evidently a stepping stone to something further, this 1637 book was intended to be the statement of the ecclesiastical polity, retained and reclaimed by no less than the court of the king himself. It is then to Charles himself and the Chapel Royal that we should look, depending on who you are, either to blame or to thank for this. Lord, of course, was the implementer and doubtless the encourager behind the scenes. But in the end, it was, as in 1549, royal religion that he was implementing and encouraging. There's so much more that can be said, but I'm conscious that I probably am beginning to overrun the allotted time and you probably want some questions or to go and get lunch. But before I end, let us return to those windows of 1645. Nobody quite knows what became of them. We assume they were broken. A few broken fragments of glass were found and here and have been put together. But they are literally mere slivers, very sad, because they just give a tiny idea of what it might have been like. However, for a far better idea, we need to go to the Church's Conservation Trust Chapel at Withcote in Leicestershire, where, as some of you will know, a remarkable series of windows from about 1530 um, survives, and which was said to be given to the chapel by one of Henry's courtiers. And it is also said to have been made by Galen Hone, the king's glazier, who was probably involved in the making of the Hampton Court windows. But what is most remarkable is that it not only does its, the series at Withcote replicate the lower scheme that once adorned the windows here at Hampton Court, but the proportions of those windows are very, very similar. Indeed, it, is it too much to hope that these windows were rescued, or some of them in 1645, and taken to Leicestershire? That's probably a pipe dream. But at the very, very least, it is almost certain that based on the London ones, those windows now replicate and thus present the last remaining element of Henry VIII's glass here at Hampton Court. Thank you so much, Father Anthony. That was fascinating. And thank you to all of our viewers um, who are watching, um, especially to those who are watching um, internationally. I know we've got viewers from West Virginia and Pennsylvania in the United States and in Australia as well. So welcome and thank you so much for joining. We're now going to move into um, questions. So we've got about 20 minutes here for questions. Um, so please do use that comment box below and ask your questions. We've had some already. So, Father, um, our first question um, is, um, when and why did the concept of a royal peculiar develop? Um, the, well, the royal peculiar is something that's di is extra diocesan. So, for us, the, the ordinary, in a diocese it would be a bishop, in the ordinary uh, is the queen. So, it's the queen's private chapel. Um, in the Middle Ages, there were loads of peculiars. So, so for instance, I think of um, Bocking and um, Hadley in Suffolk. They were peculiars of 
the Archbishop of Canterbury, even though they were in the di or one was in the Diocese of London, the other was in the Diocese of Norwich. But the diocesan bishop had no authority over those. And indeed, the Vicar of Bocking and the Vicar of Hadley are called deans, a slightly peculiar, um, give the pun, um, uh, uh, remnant. And they happened all over the place. So, for instance, Ripon Minster in Yorkshire, which is now Ripon Cathedral, was surrounded by um, the Diocese of Chester. Bizarre to think that, but the Diocese of Chester went right up there. But Ripon was a, was, a, was a collegiate church of the Diocese of York, so it's a peculiar little island somewhere else. Uh, they were all over the Middle Ages. And, and also, I think the thing with the Chapel Royal is we've got to think of it, it's not like Windsor and the Abbey. The Abbey, of course, is a later thing, so let's just put that aside. Um, the Windsor was like a monastic thing, so it actually had its own jurisdiction. That the head of Windsor ecclesiastic is the dean, as the head of the abbey would have been an abbot, and so the abbey um, liberty, um, so in the Middle Ages at Westminster and other abbeys, would have belonged to the abbot. No bishop had the authority there. Um, the chapel royal itself was a person, was a private chapel to the monarch, so basically we went around with the monarch, the priests and singers went around with the monarch, and the chapels in the houses became known as chapels royal. The chapel royal is people, I'm the chapel royal, I, I make the chapel here, the chapel royal, rather than it being an institution, uh, being a building itself. And so in that sense, as monarchs had chapels, well, you know, as monarchs have had chapels, as long as monarchs have had chapels, you know, from Charlemagne, if not before, that, that concept goes back a long, long way. The peculiar thing I think is much more, it's probably something that's, it's probably a Norman thing, I would, I would guess. I'm not a great historian on this, but it goes back to various, I think it's the abbeys started that, and then various collegiate churches were founded by people. And you get this bizarre thing, and then um, churches were given, uh, patronages were given to abbeys and so there's a little bit of abbey that belonged to someone else somewhere else and the medievaling was just a patchwork of it and it was all a lot of it was swept away at the reformation but it did survive for instance wolverhampton had a royal peculiar the the um the the, the college uh, uh, at wolverhampton lasted until the 1840s when uh, the government abolished quite a lot of these it was great sad sadness so it used to be the dean of wolverhampton was the dean of windsor and they used to wear scarlet as well i don't know whether they still do um so these, these funny things survive, but it's, I think it's a two thing. The, the Chapel Royal itself is a private chapel, so in that sense it's, it, it literally is answerable to the Queen uh, um, alone, really. But the peculiar is, I think, a remnants of medieval monasticism and uh, of that. I can't say a date, it's just, I think they just, most of these things just develop over time. Thank you for that, and thank you for the questions. Um, I think that's answered a couple of other questions that has come in <laughs> right. um, about peculiars there. Um, we hear about the Chapel Royal Choir being at the field of the Cloth of Gold. Um, is this true? Yes, yeah. In fact, had we, had we not gone into this wretched lockdown, we were going to do a reconstructed Sarah Mass with the procession um, here and, and sing some of the music that was, would have been sung there. And there was the English and the French Chapel Royal Choir and with the English and French music, and we know some of it about it. And actually, um, in the recent uh, magazine for the um, Royal uh, School of Church Music, there's a very good article by Magnus Williamson on the music uh, at the Chapel Royal. So if any of you are members of that or can uh, source that, do read that. It's a very good scholarly article. But yes, the Chapel Royal, the Chapel Royal would have gone wherever the king went, the Chapel Royal went with him. So basically what happened was um, they would just pack up. The, so the sergeant of the vestry is the verger and they would have grooms of the vestry, um, one of whom is our verger here at um, uh, at Hampton Court and they're called grooms because literally they would load up the horse and track with the chapel precious things so they would stick all the vestments on they stick all the plate they stick all the books and they would go with the king um, wherever he went um, so there would have had to be quite a few grooms and quite a lot of horses and carts for this um, the chapels might have had one or two things that were left there a missile or two but but most of the the, the nice stuff went with the king and at um, Stonyhurst, we there are um, uh, the surviving a, a chasuble and a cope. The cope is now in the V&A, um, which were coronation vestments from Westminster Abbey, and, and things that I don't know whether they were used at the cloth of gold, but it's things like that. That quality would have been um, accompanying the monarch um, through all these places, because it was as I say, the chapels are. It, it's a chapel of people. It's like the church is the people, not the building. The buildings are named after the people. The chapels are named after us, and so yes, very much. So we would have been there. Um, it's quite, quite, and at Agincourt as well. Um, we had a wonderful thing with the Chapel of St James's. We went out to celebrate Agincourt uh, with the um, the boys, which was bizarre. And Agincourt is a field in the middle of France. We went out there and we got the boys reading bits of Shakespeare, and and the locals must have thought 
these mad Englishmen, what they thought we were. But there we were, stood there um, on, the, on the battlefield of Agincourt, the Chapel Royal, in 2016, doing the same thing. It was, it was as eccentric as it always has been. Fantastic. Um, uh, another question that's coming here. Um, what other chapel rules have there been that we've lost? Oh, loads of palace chapel rules. Yes, I mean, think of Greenwich. Greenwich Palace was important. Richmond, um, none such. I mean, Greenwich, we, we know there's a chapel there. there are, you can see the remains of the chapel if you go to Greenwich uh, today, which is very worth going to see. Richmond Palace, there are bits of Richmond Palace now. Um, still there, which have been turned into houses. You can see a bit of that. Henry had loads of palaces. They were all over the place. I mean, I think the Chapel Royal par excellence in some senses, the Royal, Ch or Royal Chapel, would have been St Stephen's College at Westminster, which of course is the original Royal Palace, which later became the House of Commons. And the, the footprint is still there. The, under, the Undercroft, St Mary Undercroft, is the under, um, is, was, was the basement of that chapel. And that still survives. That survived the fire. The bit above is now built as St Stephen's Hall, but that was based on the Sainte Chapelle in, in Paris. So that was, that was also a college in itself. It was, there, was a, there were canons and a dean and canons there. So loads, basically. I think the, the, we are the four London chapels. Uh, there. So it's here, the Tower of London, the Savoy, which is the Johnny Come Lately, as it were, and um, I've forgotten the other one. Here, the Tower, oh, St James's Palace, shouldn't get that one. Um, they're, the, they're the four sites. Um, there were chapels, at, there were palaces elsewhere, but the Chapel Royal now is the London Chapel Royal. Thank you for answering that. And that was a great question, by the way. So thank you for asking that. Um, Father, could you say a bit more about the likely garb of Elizabethan choristers? Oh, they, well, we know exactly what they were because there's a wonderful um, painting uh, of Elizabeth's funeral. So it's, uh, uh, so we, it shows the Chapel Royal there. So the, um, the boys would have worn a surplus a black cassock and a surplice, like choirs do. The scarlet cassock is a is a, a 20th century um, innovation that they would have just worn black or possibly other colours, but they're, they're, dep they're depicted there in black, um, not least because it was probably a funeral. And the men would have worn surplice and cape. So the entire Chapel Royal establishment, the gentlemen who were sworn in, they weren't just singers who just came in and just went, they were sworn in, as they still are, were part of that college, um, so they also dressed for the occasion. So it must have been an incredible sight just seeing all of these people in these glittering vestments. It must have been so hot on a day like this. It would have been absolute hell. Just imagine it with candles lit, them all in that, um, singing in coats, which would have been a medieval precedent because that's what happened um, in churches. So copes are a choir uh, robe. That's why they survived the Reformation because they don't actually have any sacramental um, association, a layman could wear them, but they're pretty. Um, and so the, everyone would have been dressed in coats, the, 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 the heralds were we heard from that, that um, description. It would have been a riot of colour, like the coronation. So yes, the, the, the boys would have worn just surplus and cassock. They, the, the Tudor uniforms that the boys at St James wear now is a, it started in the 18th century, so it's a bit of a revival. Um, but surplus and cassock and the boy and the men, cassock and cassock surplus and cape. Thank you. Um, and people, please do, um, all those watching, please do um, keep your questions coming. Um, another one here, that, um, is there any evidence of burning incense in the chapel royals? Yes, there is. And, and, and in here, um, later in Charles's time, they would have, um, they had the perfumer. So it was basically to make the place smell a bit nice. Um, and I have to say, having been close, you know, the, the, the chapel could do with a bit of incense swung in this at the moment because it's very, very fussy at the moment, uh, despite the fact services have continued. But yeah, they would have made it smell nice um, for medical reasons as well. And we've got to remember one of the great chapel royal traditions is the offering of gold, frankincense and myrrh at Epiphany, which has survived until now. We still do it. Um, and that myrrh probably would have been a burn. It, it's for health reasons as well as anything else. They wouldn't have had theorables like we do at high mass, as it were, but, but something would have been more like a, a, um, a warming pan or something. And again, you see, I think it's in the procession, of, uh, a depiction of the procession of James II's coronation, Sanford's history of the coronation of James II. You see a verger, the, the sergeant of the vestry, and you see someone next to him in a multi and Latin cassock, um, waving this funny thing, which is the incense. So there would have been that going in the procession as well. So yeah, incense was, was burnt and we know as it says in here that they had the, the perfumers uh, for use in the chapel so 
that was in Charles's time, so that survived right up until um, the, 17th, the 18th, 18th century. I think a lot went with William and Mary, um, and then Queen Anne brought it back, but I think things just fell out of use, really, um, and the Hanoverian monarchy wasn't really interested in such things like that. Um, so it just, just went into abeyance. And we, we've spoken, and you've mentioned there that, you know, the, the chapels were really a personal um, chapel to the sovereign. Um, we kind of finished on Charles I. Um, so I wondered, um, what kind of significance do you think that the chapel role played at Hampton Court to Charles I, given he spent quite a lot of time there? Um, it would have been the place where he would have received his daily devotions, whether it was in the chapel building or in the closet. I think the, the monarch would have come to chapel on high, they have the holy day closet, which is basically the royal pew now, and they would have come on Sundays and holy days. For the rest of the time, prayers um, and before the Reformation, uh, mass would have been celebrated in the king's bedroom. I mean, we, Henry heard mass whilst he was getting dressed and doing business. I mean, it sort of seems a bit blasphemous to us, but you know, there was, there was the priest saying mass whilst Henry was getting out of bed, but that's how it was, and the masses would have just happened all the time. And so the chaplains would have been, um, uh, ministering to the king and largely um, you know they would have been the, the, the dean and, 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 and the bishops but, but there would have been resident chaplains as well people like me and Wolsey uh, became a chaplain uh, to the king uh, Henry the seventh before um, going on to his great state he was often a way to get get promoted um, sadly that doesn't happen now but um, it's, a, it's a quite the opposite uh, but I think it, yes so the chapel would have ministered and, the, and and in Charles's time I mean they would have had daily sung services like a cathedral probably sung morning and evening prayer every day which would have just gone on and the court would have attended King would have attended probably on Sundays but he would have had prayer more um, uh, uh, personal and, and that still happens I mean Her Majesty um, uh, doesn't come to our chapels, but the, there's a chapel in, in Windsor um, where uh, she, she goes in the Great Park, but um, she's ministered to by uh, the Dean of Windsor and various others as well, um, privately, but that's a very private thing um, from the public or semi-public appearance. And but you've, you've mentioned there again, um, about sort of the, you know, the Royal Henry and sort of having the chapel, um, you know, sometimes mass in his bedroom while he's getting dressed. Um, Obviously, famously, Hampton Court Palace was once um, or was built originally by um, Cardinal Thomas Wolsey. Um, how much or sort of of the chapel today actually or the footprint was built by Wolsey or was most of it actually Tudor onwards? Uh, quite a lot of it, actually. I mean, Henry uh, took over and, and expanded. Um, of the Tudor surviving bits, most of it is now Wolsey because Henry's biggest addition, apart from uh, the range, which is to my left down here, which is the, uh, the um, nursery range and uh, kitchens, um, he, he rebuilt the, he built the state apartments, which were pulled down and rebuilt by Wren. So that bit's gone. The, the most notable bits of Henry um, to survive are the Tudor Great Hall, which is incredible, a huge, great building, which also actually people... They also question that, whether that was a bit of Wolsey there. And the ceiling of the Chapel Royal. The chapel building itself, the walls are Wolsey. Um, not that you can see inside, there's nothing you can see at all of Wolsey inside now, but the, the walls, outside walls are Cardinal Wolsey. And in 1536, Henry um, had this incredible, the, the ceiling of the Chapel Royal. Um, had I had any foresight, I would have had a nice slide to show, but you can Google it. The ceiling of the chapel, or go to, go to our website and see it. The ceiling of the Chapel Royal is a Henry um, thing that was stuck onto Wolsey. So, that's the most notable bit of Henry, but a lot of the palace is Wolsey, and actually the oldest bit of it is actually pre-Wolsey, a bit of its 15th century from a, the manor house that was here before. And before then, it was a, um, a what is called a camera of the Knights um, Hospitaller, which is now known as the Knights of Malta. So there's been a Hampton Court Chapel here actually for about 800 years, probably dedicated to St John, which we kept yesterday. So funny enough, there's a, there's a tradition of worship that's been going on longer, much longer than Henry. Um, and much longer than Wolsey. Fascinating. I think we've got time for two more questions which have come in. So, um, despite the lockdown, um, how have services continued at the palace for you? How have you been able to cope during lockdown at Hampton I, <laughs> I, It's been me saying mass to, 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 the, to God and the ghosts. Um, I mean, as, as far as we've been able to, I've been saying services in the chapel. We've recorded uh, some of Sunday, and indeed, just before this, I've been in chapel recording myself preaching to a camera, which has been frustrating because certainly there was one service when I, I, I recorded it and realised the, uh, the phone had run out of juice halfway through. So a few choice words that God and the ghosts heard, and I had to do the whole thing over again. 
Um, I've, I've been maintaining the prayer life of the palace as much as we can. There's been no one coming, uh, but it's really important to keep the prayer going as much as possible in the chapel. Um, so that as, as much as we've been allowed to, obviously, with the restrictions, but as, as soon as we could, the chapel, uh, the worship has been going on in there. And when it hasn't, I've been saying prayers at home because that's what the priest has to do. You don't just stop. It has been a bit weird. I mean, on Easter Day, I mean, Easter Day here, as you can imagine, is just glorious. It's just the place is absolutely packed to the gunnels. You have brass, uh, quintet. The choristers are high on Easter eggs, so they sing their little souls out. Um, and and then in the evening, we have even solemn even song, and then they have an Easter egg hunt, which is just manic. And of course, none of that happened. And I did feel really quite bereft that the family wasn't here um, on Easter Day. It was, that was quite, quite a difficult thing. But, you know, there are worse places to be locked down than, than, than in the biggest garden in London, <laughs> really. And it has been very beautiful. And I think part of it's been going around seeing the emptiness and actually a bit of, a bit of the overgrownness. It's, it'll never be like it again. And I've captured pictures for those who are interested, uh, 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 friends of mine who are interested of, of, you know, things slightly becoming overgrown in that rather beautiful way that perhaps would have happened when the First World War started, when the staff had to, when houses had to lose their staff because they went to, to war and the, the gardens became a little less uh, kept. It's, it's an interesting, in every sense of the word, time. No, uh, and thank you for answering that question, Father. Um, Finally, I think it's a really nice question to, or to finish on, given sort of um, uh, what Peter um, introduced um, and mentioned in. Um, how did you find the prayer book on eBay? And could you tell us a little bit more about oh, it? Oh, gosh. Oh, I have another lecture. I, I, I was just... Those of you who do eBay, you sometimes... When you, you, you have things saved, you can see, oh, see something similar. And, and I do that from time to time, just to see, I look, I look out for Hampton Court stuff because it's quite good to collect, because we all like to have things connected with where we are. Um, and not least for me, for my personal collections. And I just looked and there was this Hewlett Ripp prayer book. And I thought, oh, well, gee, let's, you just look on these things. And I saw, well, fine, that's interesting. Um, but can I afford it? It's a bit expensive and, you know, I do have to eat. I, it's, it's basic, but, but it, the thing is it had, um, the logo, so it had the, uh, the, the coat of arms with the, the garter round it and the crown and ER, which is basically the household logo, it was then, still is. And I thought, this is interesting, it's not Royal Arms, it's not just ER, it, it, it looks a bit more domestic. And, and I, 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 I asked one or two people in the know and they, they agreed. And so um, I, I put my faith in and, and, and bought it. And then when it turned up, I looked through and then it had this prayer from the um, Touching for the King's Evil, which couldn't have been from anywhere else apart from for the Chapel Royal. It, I mean, it's the earliest version known. Um, and that was that was a surprise. <laughs> and and it is quite it is unique. And we're hoping um, to do something with it to, to put it on display uh, uh, for an exhibition um, uh, and with other stuff from Royal uh, Liturgy. So th that's in future a good reason to come and come to visit Hampton Court when that's on. But yeah, it was totally total luck, total luck, as these things often are. So um, there you go. I didn't eat for a month, but um, there you are. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Father, for answering the question. Thank you, George. That's been fascinating. And thank you to all of our viewers um, who have joined us today. Obviously, this ha is part of a series, so join us next week at 1pm when Dr Emma Wells will be joining us again. And she'll be giving a lecture on the business of saints, and she's going to be looking at how pilgrimage affected the construction of parish churches across England. So do, do join us at 1pm next Thursday. Finally, if you have enjoyed these lectures, please do consider making a donation. As I said, you can make one securely through our website, which is visitchurch.org.uk, or you can text CCT to 70331 to give a gift of three pounds. Thank you so much for joining, but do like our Facebook page and do check out our events page for further details of upcoming lectures. And we look forward to welcoming you next week. Thanks ever so much. Brilliant. Um, that stopped. Thank oh, you, Father. That was.